Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom. Last week, we looked at the Song of Moses, which the people of Israel sang after God delivered them from the Egyptians through the Red Sea. We took a little detour in that conversation, I'm sure it made perfect sense at the time, to talk about comic book vigilantes like Batman and the Punisher. Seems we have a soft spot for characters who offer justice that seems more satisfying, more perfect than the ordinary courses of law enforcement and the justice system that operate slowly and by methodical rules. Sometimes the real criminal gets away and sometimes the wrong guy gets punished. In our world today, it's often true that small offenses receive a disproportionately severe punishment, while powerful offenders are much more comfortable, even behind bars, than they should be. But Greg, you have a case to make to the effect that a functional justice system will always be an imperfect justice system because of man's sinful nature. So how can we be thankful for something that's by nature imperfect? There's a a guy at church, and every time I ask him, how are you doing? He says, great for a guy who ought to be in hell. (laughs) And I think that that's something we collectively as a church kind of struggle with. And certainly as American and Western culture, ever since the birth of Romanticism, we have this idea that mankind and therefore the human situation is perfectible. Take it easy, take it slow, give us enough time, give the powers that be enough power, enough knowledge, enough money, and they can create something that will be ultimately just and fair and that will help reshape society for everybody's best interest. This is a false gospel, Mm -hmm. and we need to recognize it as such. Uh, Very much today we're confronted with, uh, with Satan's gospel, the one he preached to Eve in paradise, that the problems with the system, the problems with the environment, the problems with society, if we could just fix all of these things, then everything would be fine, and we'd all be happy. The message of the Christian gospel is, um, this side of Christ's second coming, no. Through the blood of Christ and the power of the Spirit, can we live lives that are better tomorrow than they were yesterday? Certainly. But the Bible leaves no room for perfectionism. It gives us the, the, the only pure, holy, perfect standard for moral behavior, but at no point does it suggest that we are capable of reaching it, even through faith in Christ, on this side of the second coming. And this is the great divide. Before we start talking about this technique or that program or this approach to jurisprudence or law enforcement or punishment, this penal system, we we got to step back and say, wait, what is man actually capable of? And what man is capable of easily is sin. And and so when we look at a criminal or a defendant who hasn't been judged a criminal yet, or the judges, or the attorneys, or the jury, or the lawmakers, the first thing we need to note after we note that they are God's creatures made in his image is that they are sinners. And they all have access to grind, and they all have perspectives that fall short of the glory of God at some point or another. And if they're not even professed Christians, it gets a whole lot worse really fast. And as Christians, we, we, we recognize that this, this is reality. And not to bend to that reality is sort of like saying, um, I'm going to jump out of this plane and fly because <laughs> I deserve to be able to fly. I'm that good. And anyone who who really thinks that they're that good should come with me. We'll just jump out and we'll start flying because that's the way the world ought to be. And any compromise with that is just unacceptable. Yeah, you know, you're going to go splat real fast. And uh, we, since the uh, the Enlightenment and since the age of Romanticism, we keep looking at a world that says, give us more time and we will find a way to be more loving than you Christians. We will come up with a penal system that's better at changing character than your gospel. We will find modes of punishment that aren't as cruel and unusual as those your Bible prescribes. Give us time and we'll make it work. In the meantime, you know, so victims suffer a little bit, but you wouldn't want to really hurt an innocent person, would you? And, And that's where everything's thrown back in our face. But if you pursue this kind of justice, traditional justice, 
innocent people will end up in jail. Innocent people will end up executed. And that, of course, is intolerable, right? I was, I was reading a, a novel by P.D. James, which I will not I will not name nor recommend because although it had some interesting <laughs> things, uh, the overall tone was horrible. But uh, one of the one of the characters, a lawyer or a soci- no, a sociologist, is is talking to someone at his dinner table, and the subject of capital punishment comes up, and someone throws out, "Well, but but capital punishment means that some innocent people might be executed," and that, of course, is the prima facie immediate argument for uh, abolishing the death penalty, to which there is no reasonable response. Now, moving on, way. <laughs> <laughs> Not ready to move on yet. <laughs> uh, you know, when God when God instituted capital punishment, He knew that, and that's something that we, both as Americans and, and as Christian Americans, really struggle with. You mean you're going to endorse a judicial system that actually could execute an innocent person, and you're all right with this? There's a number of answers to that. One one being, well, God says so. Another is. So, but you are going to endorse a um, judicial system that locks people up and takes 20, 30, 40 years of their lives in in incredibly barbaric conditions, and you're right with that. And Um, and not only that, but, sorry, this is a little bit of a sore point with me, but you're going to pay to keep these people alive, Mm -hmm. which costs the taxpayers an inordinate amount of money. Mm-hmm. And makes it, these criminals better criminals because now they get to train with the worst of the best or yeah. the best of the worst. Mm. I, I don't know how many um, criminal justice programs you've ever watched on TV or the movies. I've seen enough in the last year or two to just be completely, even, even assuming it's not exactly accurate, and I'm sure it's not to some extent. It's bad. I have I have a close relative who did time for something that was... He was stupid when he was young, got conned into something he shouldn't have done, but he had to endure the prison system. He's told us what it's like. It's just absolutely horrible and abominable. Mm. And that was like 20 years ago. I'm sure it hasn't gotten better. At some point, we we, we talk about the uh, penitentiary system in America. I don't remember where that falls in our line of discussion. But it was an attempt at at, at judicial reform or penal reform. Let's lock, let's, let's take people out of the crowded dungeons where we don't feed them and we don't take care of them and, and we just leave them forever. Okay, that would be good. That would be biblical. The Bible doesn't authorize prison or jail time or anything like that. And let's stick them in little cells like monks, uh, isolated from all humanity like monks, except they didn't choose this, with a window up to heaven, which they call the eye of God. So that God will always be looking down on them. We'll get them a, a scrap of manual labor to do. We'll put a Bible in the room. They get a pastor to visit them once a year or once a month or something. And uh, under these circumstances, surely they will turn to God. If not, they're probably going to be driven so crazy that they'll never want to come back to this institution anyway. So we win anyway. Penitentiary. Penitence. This was supposed to make people sorry for their sins and drive them to repentance and change their nature. It didn't work. Um, and to, and then we pass through that whole, well, let's if we're nicer and more loving and more kind, then we can come up with a penal system. And we've been through that. And it didn't work. And now we're just, well, uh, we don't really know what to do with these people. It's society's fault anyway. So, um, oh, there's a disease, a disease ravaging the country. Let's let a lot of them out because <laughs> why not? Well, the society's fault, what I was trying to get at before, and I kind of lost my way, but when you you force society to shoulder the cost Mm -hmm. of these of these lives, who is really being punished? And I I mean, I'm sure it's a punishment to be in prison, of course, but also who else is being punished? You're also at a disproportionate amount, you know, far beyond what it would cost to repay some of the smaller offenses. Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know we're... if that was any clearer than before. But... No, well, it, it, it definitely is because, you know, if somebody steals uh, above a certain threshold and let's, I don't know, I don't remember what the exact amount is for grand theft. I think it's $1,500 in California. Yeah. It keeps going up. It is. Okay. Uh, whatever the amount is, you know, it's not, it, it is dwarfed in comparison with the cost of, of housing and, and, and feeding for 
10, 15, 20 years, depending on, you know, how long they decide to throw these people in into the prison for. And the person who got stolen from more often than not doesn't get paid back. Yeah. So you've you've made three victims. You've made one person who loses 20 years of their life instead of actually paying back a proportionate amount mm-hmm. uh, of what they've stolen. You have the taxpayer who now shoulders the additional burden, and you have the original victim who doesn't get any of his stuff back in the first place. Yeah. Now, this is justice, you may thank us. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Thanks, uh, I hate it. <laughs> you know, at some point, we're going to talk a little more about the Bible's um, overall penal system. Uh, I mentioned the fact that the Bible does not authorize prison time or jail time at all, except as a, a holding period for a very quick trial. But that's and that brings us to what we want to mm. talk about. The Constitution, the United States Constitution, insists that every citizen has the right to a swift and what's the other word? Speedy. Speedy I trial. Think. No, there's something else. I lost it. Swift and public. Ah, that's what I it should is. have looked. Anyway, <laughs> by Jeremy Spears. Swift. Uh, we lost that. I don't know when. A long time ago now. Um, but the idea there is rooted in Scripture. The the assumption of the couple times where Israel didn't know what to do with someone, and in this case, both times the the evidence was clear. They knew the they knew the person was was guilty. They just didn't know what the proper punishment was, and they waited on God to sort things out for them. They waited a night. The guy was in, in jail in ward for a night, and then judgment was given. There's there's nothing in Israel's theocratic republic who suggests that you would put somebody into that kind of seclusion, that kind of imprisonment, as a punishment. Now, and this is something people are not going to like, but we're, unfortunately we're going to have to talk about it another time. There was such a thing as indentured service or penal service to pay back money that you had stolen and did not have. But that was a far cry from being locked up with a bunch of criminals under the most horrible of circumstances. You live with a family. You went to church on, well, synagogue on the Sabbath day, and you were supposed to be treated well, and it was... You just worked until the debt was paid off, and it was predictable. And when you were done, you were restored to society with full rights. We'll talk more about about the the whole thing later. But what we want to talk about today, though, is how is it possible to do a swift trial, given the extreme volume of cases that float through America's court system? Is it just the nature of things that it it takes forever? Is Is there a better way of having a judicial system that processes accusations, evidence, and and finally verdicts. And when we turn back to the 18th chapter of the book of Exodus, shortly after the whole Song of Moses and the quick quick track to Sinai, the law at Sinai hasn't been even been given yet. That's two chapters away. In chapter 18, Moses encounters his father-in-law, who has come to greet him, to bring back his wife and kids, after the whole thing with the plagues and, and, and the crossing of the Red Sea and all that. And uh, this man's name is Jethro, not a name we use much anymore, unless you are a fan of the group Jethro Tull, <laughs> or, or there's uh, some criminal investigation series that has a hero named Jethro, which I used to watch. I don't remember which one it is anymore. But this Jethro was a, a prince and priest of Midian, so he had some leadership experience. He seems to have been a very godly man. Uh, and, and and he greeted Moses. They had a great time together. The next day, Moses gets up and goes out, and the people start standing in line from morning till evening. And, and Jethro watches this with some amusement and some amazement. And at the end, says, what are you doing? Moses says, well, the people come to me with the problems, and I make them know the law of God, and then I I, I, I pass judgment, and I tell them how this, this particular thing's going to be solved. This is um, what Jethro says. The thing that thou doest is not good. (laughs) Thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that's with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now to my voice, and I will be, and I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. And I'm going to pause there for a second. 
what we need to make really clear is that Moses had a direct pipeline to God. He was a prophet, and he was a prophet like no other prophet until Jesus came. If the people wanted to know what God said, God would tell him. He was right every single time. He got the proper balance between justice and mercy. He knew who was lying. He knew all of the, the, the quibbles and the qualifications. He could hand out ideal, perfect justice every single time. The problem was you had to wait in line for it. And given that we're dealing with two million people, that could be a really long line. And Jethro looks at this and says, this isn't working. And what he says in essence is there's something better than perfect justice, and that's swift, dependable justice. Mm. And then he goes on to make some very specific recommendations to Moses, and these should sound a bit familiar to any good American. He says this, Be thou for the people to God, word, that thou mayest bring the causes to God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. All right, so the first thing is, yeah, you're the big cheese, you're the buck stops with you, you will talk to God, but beyond that, you need to teach these people what the laws are. These need to be a people who already know right from wrong, who already know what the law says. They, Of course, the giving of the Ten Commandments and the case laws is right around the corner, but they need laws. They need to be a people instructed in God's moral law. But then... Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and make such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds and rulers of fifties and rulers of ten. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge, so that it shall be easier for thyself and they shall bear the burden with thee. If thou shalt do this thing, and God command thee so, then thou shalt be able to endure, and all this people shall also go to their place in peace. So Moses hearkened to the voice of his father-in-law, and did all that he had said. And Moses chose able men out of all Israel, and made them heads of, over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, rulers of ten, and they judged the people at all seasons, the hard causes they brought into Moses, but every small matter they judged themselves. And there's a reference to it also, Deuteronomy 1 or to a similar kind of thing. Two things. First, the kind of men that were to be chosen, and second, how the system worked. First thing, here are the qualifications for being a judge. Notice what's missing. They're to have ability at this kind of thing. They are to fear God. They are to be men of truth, that is, they're to be honest. They're to hate covetousness. They're not going to take bribes. That's it. <laughs> no law degree? No law degree. No, because the law is supposed to be so basic that anybody who has a fundamental understanding of God's word should be able to judge most things. Uh, and here we can appeal to... Um, Paul's words to the Corinthian church. If you have a, a squabble and you can't find some, set them who are least esteemed in the church to judge. What is there not one mm -hmm. wise man among you who can judge between brother and brother? God's people are supposed to know God's law well enough that on basic stuff, you, you stole from him. You need to pay it back. <laughs> well, but he ticked me off. That is it. <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of things are really easy, and it's just stubbornness and an, an unwillingness to to repent that aren't the issue. You just need someone to point it. No, that's wrong. We all know it's wrong. Yeah, you know, you're gonna do the right thing because I'm a judge. The second thing then is the is the system. He doesn't explain it in, in any detail. We have to kind of read between the lines. He says that you're going to place them to be rulers over thousands and hundreds and fifties and tens. That could be reading from the top or from the bottom up, but I think it's reading downward. Uh, the Bible generally, this is a covenantal passage. The Bible thinks in terms of families, 10 families would be the smallest unit. In other words, what we think of as a neighborhood, 
And in, in an age when people actually knew their neighbors and didn't really know people on the other side of town, if you had a problem with someone, odds are it was going to be your neighbor, someone who lived in, in our terms somewhere on your block or across the street or something. All right. So each neighborhood gets some kind of um, captain, judge, overseer or something. And, okay, your dog keeps knocking over my trash hands, trash cans. Let's go find Ned. Let's let him decide who's right. Okay, so your dog goes after the trash cans. Why are the trash cans there? Well, because otherwise I'd have to move my cars all the time. Could you try putting them someplace else? But his dog. Okay, what, what's with the dog? Why isn't the dog in your yard? Well, he needs to, uh, and, you, and you can figure out how it goes from there. Ned's going to listen to each side. And eventually he's going to say, you, dog on leash. You find a better way of managing your trash cans. Are we done here? Anybody want to pay a fine on this one? Didn't think so. Case closed. On your way. That didn't take long. How much do you think this guy's salary needs to be? <laughs> probably not a lot. And probably no one's going to try to assassinate him. <laughs> it's not It's not a particularly dangerous kind of thing. Yeah, you might tick off some of your neighbors, but you have an equal chance of ticking them all off or making them all your friends, depending. Um, uh, maybe the neighborhood at the end of the year gets together and buys you a Hanukkah gift or something. This, this is, this <laughs> Hanukkah is hasn't been invented yet. <laughs> I should have known you'd catch that. Hopefully. Chronology. He it's important, right? <laughs> Just hopefully he doesn't make everyone angry and we end up with like a murder on the Orient Express situation. <laughs> there would be that. Or would it be murder on the Orient Ned Express? Oh, <laughs> ooh. but let's say that somebody from this neighborhood crosses into that neighborhood, and the two judges from the respective neighborhoods look at each other and scratch their head and say, "Well, one of us could take this, which is a possibility, or we could appeal it up the chain to the guy who's in charge of the fifty families. He has, I don't know what you would call, I guess, the subdivision." All right. Well, let's let's get. I need a name. Um, Vincent. Vin, Vincent. We'll get Vincent. We'll, we'll we'll kick this up to his case. His caseload. All right. Well, he, there he's not. Vincent's not going to get that many cases because most of them are being solved at the lower level. Uh, but now he okay. So you cross your jurisdictional boundaries, and neither of these guys wants to look at it, or it's too hard for them. They oh, this one is actually um, hmm. I don't know about this. Well, let's kick this up. And so on. We have 10 families, 50 families, 100 families. Now we're at the size of a small village. Thousands. Now we're at the size of uh, a small town. And at each level, there's a possibility of appeal. It doesn't say the appeal is automatic. And the what little we're told suggests that the judges appeal it when they're not sure, rather than the plaintiffs being able at all times to say, well, I didn't like that. I'm appealing because that kind of is self-defeating. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably, the judges would have some say in what gets appealed, but they could always the the, the plaintiffs could always try and, and and step over him and see if they get a hearing. Vincent probably wants to respect Ned and his friend, and probably doesn't want to take all of their caseloads just because somebody wasn't happy. Uh, we have an example in Kings, First Kings of something like this. And it's it's exactly what Jethro is pointing out. When the case is too hard, it climbs all the way up and it reaches the Supreme Court, which in this case is Moses, who's a prophet, who's a direct line to God. And he'll solve those. When it's really difficult, you've tried to produce justice, but there's something you can't get at, or the, the balance is too delicate. All right, fine. Those can climb all the way up there. That's, that, that's the top of the pyramid. But it usually doesn't go that far. The people at the top don't have that much to do because most of the stuff's been solved locally. Now, remember, all of this assumes that the people themselves know the law and can work out problems on their mm -hmm. own. That was Jethro's starting point. Mm -hmm. If the people don't know the law and they're selfish and self-centered, none of this is going to work anyway. Neither is any other system. So it needs to start there. But if we, if we, uh, if it does climb in, as I said, we've got to, we have a case that we're all familiar with, but we often miss why it is what it is. Solomon has just begun his reign, and he's kind of an unknown quality. People are watching him to see what he's all about. And two prostitutes show up before his throne. And I'm surprised that more people don't say, what are two prostitutes doing with access to the king of Israel? 
Well, they're there for judgment, which almost certainly means that this started locally in Jerusalem, was appealed from Ned to Vincent to Zach to Bob real fast, as each one said, I have no idea what to do with that. I'm kicking it up to the next level. And probably really fast, it climbed the level and got to Solomon. And the, as you know, the, the case was two women arguing over their claims to a child. Is this my child? Is this your child? We were alone in the house. There's no DNA evidence. The child's not old enough for us to tell by his looks who he belongs to. You say it's yours. I say it's mine. King, decide. You're supposed to be wise. And we know Solomon's response. Because he was unknown, he could pull the, oh, fine, bring a sword and I'll cut it in half and give, it to, and give half to each of them. Uh, because he was an unknown, unknown quantity, that could work. Uh, people, people, they, people would believe that of a king because kings in the ancient world did stuff like that all the time. Solomon was, had no intention of doing it, of course, but he was able to cut through literally all the, um, the lies that the, the, the false plaintiff had raised. So there we see an example of something going all the way up to the top and the king being able to, to fix it. But that wasn't normally what Solomon did. Uh, back in David's reign, Absalom tries to play on this. Lots of people do get as far as David. And Absalom's able to catch each one who loses a case mm -hmm. and say, oh, your case, you were right. You got gypped. Oh, if only I were made judge in Israel, <laughs> then, you know, blah, blah, blah. He yeah. parlays that into, uh, into a coup. But anyway, so th this is the system that Jethro recommended with the qualification, uh, if God commands you so. And so presumably Moses consulted with God, and God did command him so because Moses instituted it. This is an appeal system. It's now basic to Western civilization, and it's implicit perhaps even in feudal society, but its strongest roots are the Presbyterian Church, coming out of Scotland and then into America, where when congregants cannot solve their problems, they, they've tried the, admin, the personal admonition, the Brother rebukes and all that, and no one's willing to give and no one's willing to admit they're wrong. It can be brought before the local church court, and if that doesn't work, it can be appealed. And you know the Presbyterian system better than I do. So, what's the next step? Session? No, session's local, and the next session's session is local, and then it's Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Presbyterian, then it's General Assembly next? Synod. Isn't, do you have synods? Yeah, we don't. Um, I think our General Assembly is your synod. Yeah. Okay. Isn't there one? Isn't there something else in there? See, this is what I get for not being thor thoroughgoing Presbyterian. <laughs> um, I think the three there's... the three levels of authority are session, presbytery, Jewish and general Jewish. assembly. Okay. So yeah. it starts local. The, the presbyteries are pretty wide. Like ours is the whole Potomac area. Okay. And I think mine is all of California and Nevada. Okay. So that's that was in place. And when the Presbyterians came to America, many of them Scots Presbyterians, who played a heavy part of the American Revolution, but that's another story. <laughs> uh, when, when, when the war was over and they wanted to reorganize, they were doing this about the same time that the Constitutional Convention was meeting and in the same city, Philadelphia. So in one part of the city, Madison and friends are rewriting the structure of American government. And in another, the Presbyterians are redefining what it means to be an American Presbyterian as opposed to Scottish or British Presbyterian. And we can begin to see the interplay. This, is, this looks an awful lot like what the American system originally looked like and what it was supposed to look like, a series of appellate courts reaching up to a Supreme Court that will have the final word but which in theory shouldn't have to do that much all the time so that everybody here, as the Constitution, as the, as the um, Bill of Rights guarantees, everyone can have a swift and public trial. It doesn't get backlog for weeks or months or years because things can be solved quickly and they can be solved locally. Now, and what that, again, bringing full circle then, and this is what every true romantic hates. But <laughs> these, this system is imperfect. 
because you're trusting imperfect men, and therefore they should have no absolute word, no final word, because what if someone's innocent and someone screws up and you're condemning an innocent man to prison or to execution, or we need something that takes more time and that guarantees more rights and with more possibility of appeal, we need to slow it down so that we don't rush to judgment, to borrow a title of a book in a different category, because this is the loving thing to do. And Christians in the Bible get tarred as unloving, unkind, and because we we insist that God actually does want a predictable, swift justice, even when sometimes we're going to get it wrong. And again, the, the true romantic just that's that's unacceptable. And they, they look at us and they, they look at us as if we're demons. How can you say that you want a system where innocent people, you, 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 you enter the system, you establish the system knowing that innocent people sometimes are going to be punished, even executed. That's just unthinkable. And on the other side of the road, the opposite ditch, uh, we have a video that goes out on Twitter. And if you don't immediately draw conclusions from it, you mm. are hashtag canceled. <laughs> um, it is so unloving and so um, unacceptable to say maybe there's more context and maybe the law enforcement system can take care of this. Maybe I, as an individual on Twitter, don't need to voice my opinion and judgment on this. Yeah, I, I've seen that in one of the one of the more recent headline things that I won't specify because it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter, I, yeah. I was surprised to hear someone whom I greatly respect uh, pronounce someone guilty when there had been no trial. I don't think charges had even been filed yet. The media, of course, had already tried the guy mm -hmm. and found him guilty for this particular incident. And by and since two, like two weeks had passed or three weeks, well, at that point, everybody knew what had happened. Everybody knew he was guilty. And so this man I respect maybe just slipped. But he just went on, and so, so, so and so did such and such. Like, um, we, we have this ruling in America that you're innocent until proved guilty. We haven't got to trial yet. But now, as you say, the voice of social media is the trial. And if the justice system tries to come back from that and present new evidence, good luck. Uh, short of a confession from someone else, the odds are it's, you're not going to get it. And if you try to push through, what seems to be an honest verdict that's contrary to what the people have already been convinced of through social media or the regular media, where you're likely to start up riots throughout the country because that's how we've learned to respond when justice isn't done the way we think it should be done based on our very limited knowledge channeled through video or newspaper headlines in a slightly older generation. And, and, and yeah, it's, and, and again, it's very much the romantic Justice needs to be served now because we care deeply. And one, one, one thing that does go with romanticism is the no compromise. Mm -hmm. If you're That's the reason willing, for both the instant judgment yeah. and the delay in judgment is yeah. this no compromise streak. Yeah. You, you must be innocent and just at all times. And, you, and, if, and if you are not so immediate, if you're not on our side immediately, then you're part of the problem. You're one of them. You're complacent. Or complicit, sorry. You're complacent too. And, and, and that's unacceptable because good people, loving people, just people, obviously see things my way and will be there instantly. And it, when, once I am convinced, everybody should be convinced. <laughs> so in that sense, we don't need a long trial. But wait, I'm convinced the guy's innocent, so you need a long trial. <laughs> I'm convinced he might be innocent. You need a long trial. He needs an appeal. He needs a second appeal. He certainly does not need to be executed because that's just inhumane. And we've created a monster that we now have to live with. Nobody wants to be caught up in the judicial system. And even when there are uh, good, even godly men as law enforcement officers trying to do the best with what they got in, and good and even godly judges trying to make the laws work, it becomes more and more of just a morass of complications and political hot potatoes. People don't know what to do next. They're afraid that if they say the right thing and do the right thing, riots are going to break out. People will die. This is where we've got, and we've, we've got there fundamentally. 
first of all, because we don't have what Jethro, first of all, insisted on, a people who know and want to do what God said. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Well, why don't you talk about that, Brian? What, yeah, what are just, your thoughts uh, there? My thoughts are um, part of the the first recommendation from Jethro is, you know, you got to tell the people the law. And the problem that we're facing all around the world, but particularly in the United States, because that's the you know context we're speaking in, is that the law has become a unnavigating of unnavigatable. Is that a word? Who knows? Yeah, close Nav- unnavigable. That's the word. <laughs> unnavigable. Just mess. I, mm-hmm. I'm reminded there's. Twitter account that I follow called Crime a Day. Yes, I was hoping you were going to bring that up. <laughs> and every day they they list a federal crime that is in the books, and you know they said something like, "Just with the laws that are on the books now, you know I have enough material to give one federal crime <laughs> a day for like forty years." Oh, um, I think it was a lot longer than that. <laughs> probably. I mean, that yeah. wouldn't surprise me either. But it also reminds me, like there are even state laws that. Mm-hmm. Just become their own incomprehensible mass of uh, self reference and disallowment. I'm reminded of one, I believe it's Nebraska, whose state legislator put it on the books that in Nebraska it is illegal to hunt whales. <laughs> I'm Nebraska, sure they had a real problem with that. Look, if you don't mark. vote against it, then obviously you're for it. That's yeah. <laughs> so that's part the of the whales problem. To die. I do. Yes. Um, so some things are political statements. We just want to go on record as people who are opposed to killing whales. It's true we don't have any, but we're going to be on record that we don't do that because yes. we're better than you guys. So yeah, it's um, it's become a incomprehensibility f- a factor. Especially for the common man who who doesn't yeah. have a law degree, you need a law degree just to understand the basic application of the law. Apparently, yes. instead of adhering to our first principles, which are based on scripture, I can tell you ten of them. Ten of them <laughs> exactly. There's a bill that lists them all, isn't there? <laughs> well, we There's were going with too. the actual commandments in scripture, but yeah. It's yes. Scripture. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I was thinking. There's, there's the Bill of Rights as well. That's yes. yeah. that's also a thing. Yes, but, um, but most citizens can't quote those. As yeah. most Christians can't quote the Ten Commandments as a matter of fact. Yeah, that's true. Mm-hmm. Although, I, in in fairness, I always mix up six, seven, eight, and nine. Like somebody says, that's a Sixth Commandment violation. I go, wait, is that murder or theft? <laughs> there's a difference between I, I occasionally screw up uh, seven and eight, but. Um, but you know what they are, and you probably can say them in order. Eventually. As part of as part of our uh, entrance exam at school for high school, and this is not you have to do this to get in. This is just I'm kind of interested to see what your your biblical background is. I ask um, state the um, the third I don't remember third seventh and eighth or ninth commandments. In all the years I've been doing that, I think I've only had two or three people. Do it, Emily. I assume you were one of them. (laughs) I actually Uh, remember my answer to that question. But what was your answer? Well, I asked you if you meant according to the Protestant or the Lutheran slash Catholic. Of course you would. I saw that coming. Yes. (laughs) That also help help doesn't help with the confusion. (laughs) (laughs) So if if you're listening and you're not aware, the Catholics and Lutherans have a different numbering of the Ten Commandments than most Protestants. Yeah. My daughters were just talking about that yesterday. Weird. But my point is that these are kids out of evangelical homes and they can't even give a good guess. Of course, they also, the other, another question is name the, the first, third, and last books of the Old Testament. And I rarely get that one either. Uh, we have raised a generation of Christians who are biblically illiterate on the most basic things. And if we've done that, then how should we expect the world to be any better in its understanding of the basic principles of civil law? If Christians can't learn 10 principles, 10 commandments by, by heart, then are we surprised that they're, well, but that wouldn't be loving. Yeah, well, God says it is. So you've got a problem here. I, I think if there is a pro- we've really seen this amplified in these last several months. If there is a problem in Christian ethics, we have been buffaloed into believing that love is the most important thing 
but we've left love undefined. All someone has to do mm -hmm. is come in and make what you're doing seem mean, cruel, arrogant, unpleasant, something I could never do. And it is now unloving, and therefore it is anathema. And whatever is the opposite, merciful, being nice, being sweet, giving people a third or fourth or fifth chance, that's love. And we should always choose love over not love. And so anything that's loving commands our whole allegiance and obedience. We need to do the loving thing all the time, but we've left love undefined. And all we need is for someone to tell us, someone with enough moral authority, like social media <laughs> or the regular media or Washington or Sacramento to say, oh, this is the loving thing you need to do right now. And everyone jumps on board. Oh, yeah, we want to do the loving thing because otherwise mm -hmm. grandma might die or something. Can, can, does the Bible address this anywhere? We, we, yeah. First of all, we don't go back to the Bible because we believe that our own sensibilities are enough to tell us what's loving. We know what's loving. Everybody knows what's loving. You're just not loving. That's why you don't understand this. In in leaving love undefined, yet recognizing that there has to be an anathema attached because there's a flip side. <laughs> the anathema also becomes undefined. And so it's whatever my passions tell me this person deserves, that's yes. what they should get for this crime that offends me so particularly. See the headlines. <laughs> yeah. This is we're seeing our world as it burns down in front of us. And it's so much is done in the name of love or pardon and excused in the name of love. Aren't you loving? Don't you care? Don't these things matter? Well, yeah, they matter. But the question is by what standard? Who tells us what's right and what's wrong? And who tells us what punishment ought to come to those who have done the wrong thing? And uh, if we trust uh, trust our own hearts to generate answers. We are fools. There's a way that seemeth right to a man, but the ends thereof are in the ways of death. And one that my wife and I have been quoting back to each other a great deal, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Mm -hmm. When wicked men, this is when wicked men are tr actually trying to be merciful. They generate cruelty, like the penitentiary system in the first place. <laughs> yeah. These were people trying to be nice. They really thought they were being nice that they were being loving, that they were being kind, and they created a horror that's still with us. But what happens when the wicked aren't trying to be nice, but just pretending to? It gets much, much worse. So when we talk about reorienting our biblical view, trying to become more biblical in our view of life, the universe, and everything, we actually have to go excuse me, back to some very practical civil matters like judicial system. We're going to talk some other time about the penal system. Uh, it's not necessarily that we need to take and cut and paste Israel's system into our modern situation, but most certainly there is wisdom here about human nature, of what is what will not work because of who man is, and of what at least at one time was certainly pleasing to God and, and in modified form survives in his church. So th this is practical stuff, but this is not the kind of stuff that you will find taught in most Christian schools, most home schools, and sadly not even in Sunday schools or from the pulpit. So that's why we do some of what we do here, just to stir the pot, get people mad at us, but at <laughs> least maybe they'll think a little bit and ask some questions. And if you want to ask us those questions or share those thoughts with us, or get mad you can at us. email us. Get mad at us. You can do that too. Send us an email at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Brian, do you have any recommendations for us today? I have a list, and one of them is uh, – <laughs> they're not all for this week, but um, okay. there's one that's been on. I think you on. should do at least two. I think I should because I – if I keep adding them at this rate, I will never exhaust them, <laughs> which is a good thing and a bad thing. So the first thing is one that's been on my list for a while. You know what? I have to catch up because I, I missed so many. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, dude, I'll do three. So. I'll do three. All right. Okay. All right. Three. Three's three's good. Good. Yeah. Uh, so my first recommendation is going to upset teetotalers, but I'm going to recommend mixology, cocktail mixing and, and stuff Yay. like that. It's a fun art to learn. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, every once in a while I go like, this is an expensive hobby. And it is, um, <laughs> which is why I have not made very much in the last several months. <laughs> but it's a uh, it's a fun pastime. You learn how different things mix together and, you know, the flavor profiles that you, you want. And then you you just learn how to make really fun cocktails like a, um, a Sazerac, which no one... Has no I've bar ever has it on the menu. It's it's like a New Orleans version of an old fashioned. I love it. Mm-hmm. Um, the next thing I'm going to recommend is physical exercise. We're all Ooh. Ooh. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> we're all stuck inside and nobody wants to exercise. And this week it's awful because it's 108 degrees. Please um, stay inside if it's 108 degrees where you are. Don't do it outside. <laughs> You're not telling me you had a heart attack because we told you you should be exercising. Yeah, don't (laughs) go out and get yourself hurt. Halting towards Zion does not endorse any medical advice. (laughs) Given by Brian Proof. Now, um, (laughs) I do not hold any kind of doctorate of any kind, so don't listen to me. But I started doing more exercising last week, walking my dog in the the morning and then in the evening after work, and then doing just some very – Eh, probably medium difficulty exercise routines for about, well, I use a, I use a specific app. It's supposed to be seven minutes long, but it always ends up being like 10 minutes. Um, and it is a great way to spend some of your time now that we're all stuck indoors still. And I highly recommend it because it is, um, it's helpful and we should all be yearning to keep ourselves healthy in general. God gave us our bodies for a reason. And I think he likes them when they're in good shape. Third thing is another book that I started reading since we recorded last <laughs> because of the aforementioned four time, and that is Ben Merkel's The White Horse King. It's oh, all yes. about Excellent. Alfred the Great. I purchased this some years ago, and I just started it yesterday or the day before, and it's marvelous. About the only thing I don't like is that in the very opening chapter, he says, In the year, Anno Domini. And I went, ah. Oh, uh, ow, ow, ow. I was like, this is worse than ATM machine. <laughs> uh, but I'm I'm in chapter two, and it's uh, there's a lot of really good detail. Uh, our, our good friend, uh, David Farshman, has read this and says that he loves it mainly be, for the primary reason that the author doesn't like shy away, as other historians do, from the fact that Alfred is a Christian and that he does these things because he's a Christian. I'm quoting David on that. You can look to him if I'm wrong Check about with that. Him. No, you're, you're, co- you're quite right. I've, I've read the book. It's very good. In fact, I, for my uh, my other employer, Bill Hyde and uh, Heirloom Audio, I wrote a book on, a booklet, aimed at Junior High Boys, on uh, Alfred. And mm-hmm. I drew from that book uh, extensively. I don't know if uh, what I wrote has ever seen the light of day. Bill, if you're listening, you might tell me. Uh, but it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun to write because uh, we we'll keep wanting to say Arthur. It's because there's a lot of similarities. Alfred <laughs> is someone we actually know a great deal about, both directly. He did have a biographer who really loved him, and so that's always considered pre- pre- prejudicial. But he's close enough into our own time, around 800, that um, there's there's other confirmatory. Um, evidence and such. And yeah, he was a Christian. He was fighting to create an England, to create England, period. Because at that point, the various, uh, what's the word? They weren't Shires. Essex and Wessex and all the other exes uh, were independent kingdoms that didn't always get along. Often they fought with one another, but they were all nominally Christian. And um, But now the Vikings were coming the the fierce northmen and um they had this 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 mean trick they would come and loot the countryside and when any of the kings showed up with their army the vikings would go hold up in a city which they, they would capture and they would just stay there and say we'll leave if you pay us a ransom and the king would look and say no but we have you yeah you do that's just a shame i guess we'll just have to stay here for a few months <laughs> And all of the farmers in the army saying, uh, our crops need tending. We don't have a few months. We have like maybe five days. So the king would kick the ground and say, fine, we'll pay your stupid ransom. At which point the Vikings would leave and go to another town and do exactly the same thing. And it was very frustrating. And uh, Alfred, when he finally had the ability to deal with it, he had to pay a ransom for once. 
uh, had to come up with a complete way of redesigning the military defenses of what was becoming England, Wessex at that time, and the structures of towns. Towns get their definition from this point because towns mm -hmm. from that point on had to be walled. They had to have thoroughfare from the back to the front and all the way around the walls and a marketplace in the center so that when the Vikings came, if they attacked on one side, your whole army could run right across the town and get there and not have to crawl over things. Mm -hmm. uh, and meanwhile, the everybody everybody served in the military for set times. So you knew that you were going to be away from your field, but you knew way in advance that you're going to be away from your field for these particular months. So you can get your, your nephews, your uncles, whoever, your cousins to step in. And then when you're back, you're back. You're not going to be called away. Mm -hmm. It was not ideal, but it's what it took so that when the Vikings came and tried to besiege one town, Alfred could blow a whistle and he had an army. And the, the army was split up among the various towns. And whatever, whatever towns were nearest, they'd send their soldiers. And suddenly the Vikings are, we can't get into the city. And there are soldiers all around us. Uh -oh. Anyway. Side issues, but on top of that, he reformed education. He insisted that his nobles learn how to read so they could read the laws. Hey, uh, yeah, back to a common theme here. He said, "Okay, if you're if you're really old and can't, then you have to pay for people to become audiobooks. Hey, <laughs> they will walk around reading to you from the books so that you get educated that way." <laughs> and there's, there's no, you, you, these are your only options. Otherwise, you don't get to be noble anymore. You've got to be educated. And then he started a translation program, particularly of um, the Bible and religious literature into the Anglo-Saxon tongue, because Latin and uh, the older languages were becoming obsolete. So he did all, and that's not even talking about uh, redesigning their finances and actually minting silver for coins as opposed to other things. Fantastic guy. Yeah. I, I jump on that recommendation <laughs> and I'm tempted to steal it. So, you know, well, it's I, choice. Um, my dear friend Josiah would be very upset with me if I missed a chance to recommend on the tail end of that G.K. Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse. Oh, yes. So, yes. For Josiah. That's in there. Josiah, Which he, if you're listening, he quotes in the beginning. Hat tip. <laughs> I also love that he he wrote the uh, the dedication in Anglo-Saxon as a poem for his wife. Oh, <laughs> that's so that. sweet. And yeah. uh, I actually took the time to look up each Anglo-Saxon word and get the kind of translation of it. Uh, but Wait, I want to read it in Anglo-Saxon. You mean Google wouldn't translate? No, Google didn't translate it for you? No. Yeah. Okay, uh, you I want to read it in Anglo-Saxon first because I like it. It sounds cool. Quatheos thegesith swa swa se morgan, thegar swa se mona, beor swa se suna, portmod swa se shildval. And I looked it up and it says, for she who I think of at the morning, fairer than the moon, bright as the sun, glorious as the shield wall. Okay, I got morning and shield wall from when you read it in Anglo Saxon. That was it. <laughs> That's impressive, right there. Side I note, got nothing. <laughs> there are people who look at the King James Bible or Shakespeare and say, That's old English. No, no what Brian just read is Old English. It's called Anglo-Saxon, and it is a language that is largely incomprehensible. I got three words because I was listening really hard to see if I could catch any. <laughs> Even and, Middle uh, English is is very far separate. Not, that's Chaucer. That's Chaucer yeah. and Mallory. Yeah. Okay, great. Emily, how about you? What? Oh, I'm going next. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I decided partway through this episode what I was going to recommend. Um, because I did not know ahead of time at all. Um, but I think I'm going to recommend Thomas Sowell's little book called A Conflict of Visions. Um, oh, Thomas yes. Sowell is an economist. Very good one. I don't know whether he is a professing Christian, but he wrote this little book called A Conflict of Visions that explains the other side. He, he defi divides people into those who think human nature is perfectible, and those who do not. And of course, we as Christians look at that and say, yeah, original sin. Mm. But he sort of explains it. If you're not familiar with that concept, you know, he doesn't go into it as a theological doctrine, but as a question of political economy, he analyzes how that's going to shape your view of policy, of the effects of human nature on what you think the government ought to do. Very concise, 
very short. My other exposure to Thomas Sowell is his book, Basic Economics, which is not short, but I can also recommend that. But A Conflict of Visions is the one I'm recommending today. Nice. Great. Um, and funny you should mention that because when we finish the Ten Commandments, one of the lectures or discussions is titled Social Vision in the Ten Commandments <laughs> that plays off A Conflict of Visions by Thomas Sowell. Hey. So we will be coming back to this. There is much good in it, but because he is not explicitly Christian, he does still have a problem with where power and authority in society comes from. And he does mm -hmm. in the end say, well, you know, all your stuff really does belong to the community, but only in extreme measures. <laughs> okay. Um, no, but but most of it is, is really good. And there's some wonderful, mm -hmm. uh, particularly examples of those who think that math's perfectible. And I know that name. And he said, what? <laughs> He's insane. But uh, yeah. So, I, I do you only have the one recommendation? Yeah, I mean, I've been here every week. I'm like <laughs> our friend Brian oh, here. <laughs> I like that subtle day get me. Thank you. <laughs> well, but you know, we, welcome we back, have Brian. Than, sometimes we have more than one. Um, I am going to recommend, and this is not like any huge surprise, uh, Francis Schaeffer's lengthier book, "How Shall We Then Live." Mm. Uh, it comes to mind because tomorrow at school, I get to talk through the first chapter or two with our faculty because many of them haven't read it, but we were looking at something to help with teacher development and such. And it's, since it deals with elements of theology, philosophy, art, and culture and such, it seemed a good starting point. And um, I know I've, I've used the videos from the series uh, for years and years at school. I assume that you both probably saw them in my class at some point. But I, I realized that I very rarely got to the last video or two where he mm. makes application. I'd seen it years and years and years ago. And one of my favorite scenes is when they, they stage a riot, students facing off with police officers, but they film it from two different directions with two different narratives. So from one, mm -hmm. one case, they film it over the shoulders of the policeman and there's a very pro-law narrative going on telling how these gallant chap, uh, champions of justice are, are peacefully trying to fend off this, these maniacal rioters who blah, 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 blah. They film this exactly the same thing over the shoulders of the young people. And there, again, with a changed narrative, these peaceful teenagers assembling have been attacked and assaulted by these. And, you know, it goes on from there about how awful the, the policemen are. And then in the third version, they simply pull back and show you what's going on. And it has a lot to say about how easily we are manipulated by the media and how what we, but I saw it on TV or Facebook or Twitter or whatever, really does not mean what you think it means. Yeah. Uh, he, has, he has a, a line that says something to the effect of every minute you see, every second you see is edited. Yeah. Merely by the fact that you only see this much, you know, every time right. you choose a starting and ending point of the video that you're going to show, you're choosing what to include and what not to include. And that's editing. And that means you are shaping the narrative. Yes. Uh, and then he also spends a good deal of time at the end talking about what, what our options are when there is no longer an absolute standard within society by which society may be judged. And what he describes is what we are seeing in the headlines now. So it starts with the history of Rome and the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and so on. Uh, if you uh, are not terribly familiar with this, it's a good introduction. It is not the final word, and he says so. <laughs> I've actually heard people complain. Well, it's it's not like it's you know an exhaustive university level. Of course not. He's talking. It's like a hundred and fifty pages. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's what did to, you expect? He's trying to give people some kind of starting point, yeah. some kind of overall quick perspective, and they don't go in expecting more than that. But still, for a lot of people, it's pretty heady stuff. There are people who have very poor educations, or they have a very good education that's been slanted so horribly they don't are incapable of of reckoning with what really happened in our history. And so th this is a good this is a good place to start. And it's available from a number of publishers because it's been published a few times over the, the last uh, couple of decades. I think uh, 
think Crossways does it. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So how shall we then live? Francis A. Schaefer recommended. Great. Thank you guys so much. It's been a great conversation. I look forward to picking it up again next week. Thanks also to David, our producer, and our, my lawfully wedded husband. If you would like to send us an email, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can follow me on Goodreads. Haven't mentioned that in a while, but I just finished a book, so it's on my mind. You can give us money if you want to do that to help us keep the show rolling. Um, you can visit our website to do that. That's anchor.fm slash haltingtowardszion. Uh, tell a friend about us. Yeah, if you're enjoying it, probably somebody else will too. So, thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully weird... <laughs> Take three. I'm struggling <laughs> with the words. It's where you tell us, tell them how they can reach yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay, Emily. <laughs> I'm sorry. Now David's looking at me. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Mom, he's looking at me.